Can you hear me? Kevin, can you hear me? Sarah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I started to go, because Heaven, uh, it wasn't responding when I asked her if she could hear me, so I wasn't sure if it was just her or if nobody could hear me. Oh, because... Yeah, I can, sorry. Okay, I was that's all right. Hey, just a, a full warning, I'm having a technical issue with Zoom, and so I uh, got on their tech support to ask the question. Well, first I wrote them an email, or uh, I wrote a support ticket two weeks ago and, and put it in the urgent category, and I have yet to hear back from them. I kind of got fed up today after two weeks. So I decided to wait in their queue uh, to chat with an agent because they won't take phone calls from my type of account. So there are 187 people ahead of me. Uh, but the, I started, there were 345 people ahead of me. So it seems to be going fairly quickly. So I'll keep talking, but I might stutter or slow down as I'm trying to type and talk to them as well simultaneously. So just so you know. Okay, we're going to start our uh, new unit today, the last unit had we been in uh, school, well, the last unit regardless whether we were in school or not and that is psychological disorders and treatments. So almost this unit is kind of a culmination of everything that we've done so far this semester and understanding different approaches and everything now and understanding you know, through the book about you know, what a, a, a disorder is, what's involved in it. And now we're gonna look at, okay, so how do we treat people with disorder? So a lot of psychology is concerned with studying and understanding the way healthy minds naturally think and behave. And for example, psychologists might look at how you perceive things with your senses and how you learn new information and behaviors. You can't go a single day without learning, though there are some teachers who might make you feel like you don't learn every day, uh, and certainly not without perceiving. So there are, these are normal functions of the brain that allow you to experience and interact with the world around you. But imagine someone whose perception is out of whack. And where most of us would hear silence, this person, let's call him Tom, hears a few distinct voices talking amongst themselves. I just read an interesting story about a guy who uh, was coming to work every day and he looked real tired and everything. And uh, his uh, you know, work buddy would say, you know, what's wrong? He goes, oh, my neighbors are just staying up all night uh, in the owl hours of the night party. And he goes, have you said anything to him? He goes, well, I went and knocked on their door and no one answered, but I could hear them talking behind the door. Uh, you know, and sometimes at night I'll bang on the ceiling and, but you know, I, I hear them yelling at me and, uh, you know, telling me to knock it off. Well, it turns out his neighbors were actually on vacation, uh, like a six month thing and uh, no one lived upstairs and it was all voices he'd heard in his head. So luckily he figured this out and was able to seek psychological help. But I mean, certainly, you know, some things like that can happen. So these voices aren't actually in the real world, they're created in Tom's head. But to Tom, they seem just like a conversation you might overhear on a bus or in a restaurant. He perceives voices that aren't real. And this is called a hallucination. And it's typically a symptom of a disorder called schizophrenia. Tom's psychological disorder is the result of something going wrong with his brain's normal functioning. And Tom's disorder interferes with his ability to perceive. Jenny has a different problem. Jenny is deathly afraid of birds, and she can blame her unusual fear, or the Greek word for fear, phobia, to disordered learning. When she was growing up, Jenny's mailbox was right underneath a mean blackbird's nest, and when her parents sent her out to get the mail, the blackbird would attack her, attack her to protect its babies. And this happened enough times that Jenny became conditioned to fear all birds. 
It's a natural and necessary process like learning can lead to unusual or disordered patterns of thinking in some cases. Psychologists who specialize in treating disorders like Tom's and Ginny's are known as clinical psychologists. And unlike research psychologists who understand or study how the average healthy mind processes information, clinical psychologists help patients who are hurting or in trouble due to psychological disorders. And in the same way most doctors deal with the problems of the body, psychological therapists deal with problems of the mind. Clinical psychologists, along with psychiatrists, uh, medical doctors trained to specialize in mental illness. In other words, there's a difference. Psychiatry, you usually have a PhD. I'm sorry, psychology, you usually have a PhD. So clinical therapists might have a PhD. Or psychiatry, they actually have a medical doctorate. And psychiatrists are the only ones, really, who can prescribe drugs. So medical doctors who are trained to specialize in mental illness are psychiatrists. Social workers and counselors are collectively known as therapists. Now, psychological disorders are defined as normal brain functioning gone wrong. And there are lots of ways that our perception and learning can be off, but luckily, there are lots of treatments also that can help. Tom took antipsychotic drugs to quiet the voices in his head, and behavioral therapy helped Jenny get over her extreme fear of birds, for example. Now, when you go to the doctor with a fever and a sore throat, he'll talk to you, examine to you, maybe listen to your breathing, and he'll use this information to figure out an explanation for your symptoms. Unless, of course, uh, Medicaid ups the amount that's being paid for a COVID-19 diagnosis, and then he might just say you have COVID-19. Sorry, just a personal aside there. So this explanation of why you are experiencing the symptoms you are is their diagnosis, which is the identification of a nature and cause of an illness. In other words, the doctor's diagnosis is what he thinks has gone wrong with you and why he thinks it's gone wrong. The doctor determines that your sore throat is infected, that's the what, and does a quick swab test to determine that it's caused by the bacteria strep, that's the why. Diagnosis in psychology is the exact same thing. If you think about it though, it can be a lot harder to figure out what's going on in someone's mind than what's going on in someone's body. You can describe to your doctor that your throat's sore and he can look at you and run tests to figure out what, why. He may even be able to, when you open your mouth uh, with a little popsicle stick, be able to see the inflammation and the soreness in your throat. If you're depressed or if you're suffering from hallucinations or delusions, your description of your own symptoms can be more difficult to follow and interpret. And there's no equivalent of a throat swab to test for depression and no way to actually see uh, what is being affected when, uh, you know, to look for in depression. So there are some ways that psychologists can diagnose patients though, and we're gonna look closer at the diagnosis and classification of mental illness in the book that makes it possible for psychologists to figure out what's wrong with patients. Now, over the years, psychologists have worked hard to figure out ways to improve diagnoses. Uh, psychologist David Rosenhan suspected that psychiatric hospitals often gave patients the wrong diagnoses, and to prove it, he decided to send in pseudo patients or healthy people pretended to be mentally ill to test the doctors and nurses at the hospitals. I had a captain uh, in the army, uh, Captain Brian Reed, and uh, we were at Alabama at the university and he uh, got wind of an experiment and he signed us both up to do it where we played pseudo patients at the University of Alabama Veterans Hospital for medical students. Uh, now, it wasn't mental health pseudo patients, but it was an interesting time. I had, they gave me a, a whole script. I had to memorize my symptoms and everything. I had to go in and it tested their diagnostic capabilities. It was kind of fun. Uh, and they served us free food, I remember too. So there was a plus there. So the pseudo patients, including Rosenhan himself, who participated uh, as one of the patients, pretended to hear voices. Now, once admitted to the psychiatric hospital, uh, though they acted normal and said their symptoms had stopped. So you might think, well, if they were acting normal, then they must have been released, right? That's where the story gets interesting. They were not released and they were not identified as having faked their symptoms. Because they had said they had one symptom at the very beginning, they were considered to have a mental illness for the rest of their life. Now, interestingly, the actual patients in the hospital were suspicious of the pseudo patients. So what you have is you have a patient over here going, he's not Cher. 
I'm Cher. Uh, he can't be Cher. And they're kind of suspicious of uh, the person who's pretending to be someone else. Like, he doesn't fit in our group. He's not really one of us. It turned out that the patients were better at identifying pretenders than the staff. Now, after Rosenhan announced these rather embarrassing results, one prominent hospital asked him to send them some pseudo patients, confident that in their hospital, the pretenders would be easily identified. Now, following the challenge, the hospital identified 48 pseudo patients out of the next 195 people who were admitted. But the, the catch was, Rosenhan didn't send anybody. None of these were pseudo patients, and they identified, you know, about a quarter of them as pseudo patients. <laughs> So experiments like Rosenhan show how difficult it is to come up with a reliable scientific system of diagnosing mental illness. And for this reason, the psychiatric community has a book that's used to identify mental illness based on the symptoms that a patient presents with. And I actually have a copy of this book sitting in my quarantine classroom. Otherwise, I would share it you know, in the classroom setting. I would be sharing it with you, letting you look at it. The good news, a lot of it is online. So you can actually Google uh, DSM-5 and find a lot of this stuff. The DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, known as the DSM, has been undergoing constant revision since its creation in 1952. The DSM lists all the recognized mental disorders and their symptoms so that when a patient comes to a psychologist and says, I feel this or I experienced that, the psychologist can look up the symptoms and know what mental disorder the patient has and how to treat it. It's just like when you go to the doctor and tell them that you have a sore throat. A psychologist is gathering information about your symptoms to diagnose you. The most recent addition of the DSM I mentioned is the DSM-5, which groups mental illnesses together based on similarities. For example, someone with a phobia and someone with social anxiety disorders both have high levels of anxiety. As such, they are both found together in the DSM-5's groupings under the umbrella of anxiety disorders. Grouping these psychiatric disorders together is called classification. And the DSM-5 has 20 different classifications with all with multiple disorders. And as you might imagine, it's a very big book. And again, if we were in my classroom, I'd show it to you. It is about yay thick. Uh, examples of DSM-5 classifications include neurodevelopmental disorders, bipolar and related disorders, sexual dysfunctions, dissociative disorders, and personality disorders, among others. As a matter of fact, the rest of this unit is going to be us going through some of these classifications uh, and explaining what they are, what the disorders underneath them listed uh, most commonly are, and things like that. So when we do cross the boundary between natural worry and the debilitating types of anxiety associated with disorders, uh, you know, at what point is that line actually crossed? So let's explore some common anxiety disorders and their potential causes. Have you ever felt anxious, maybe before a big test or an important job interview? Most of us do experience, I would even argue that all of us experience some anxiety about something in our life. A half hour or even an, half hour, an hour before you get butterflies in your stomach or find yourself nervously pacing your living room. You go over questions and answers in your head and despair that you should have started prepping months ago instead of just last week. Once the test or interview is over, you feel relieved. It went fine, you remembered everything you needed to, and your heart rate returned to normal. This kind of anxiety is a natural and normal response to a stressor like an interview. But imagine if you'd started worrying about that interview a week in advance and been unable to concentrate on anything else in the meantime. Imagine if afterward, instead of feeling relieved, you continued to worry. In other words, your anxiety was outside of what the normal person would experience in normal statistically. I hate using that word, especially since we just talked about Dr. Sachs and you know, individuality. But statistically, normal people uh, would you know, certainly not feel that extra anxiety before or afterwards. And this kind of anxiety is out of proportion to the stressor that triggered it and represents one kind of anxiety disorder, a disruptive condition that can interfere with functioning in daily life. Now, there are different kinds of anxiety disorders, and we'll start with the first most general one, ironically named the generalized anxiety disorder. So this kind we just described, which would cause you to worry for weeks about an interview, GAD, generalized anxiety disorder. Now, GAD affects approximately 3% of American adults, and it's characterized by excessive and uncontrollable worry that is disproportionate to the circumstances. 
it's fine to worry about the interview, but it's worrying all week that is the symptom of the disorder. GAD can also cause physical symptoms like fatigue, headache, nausea, trembling, and insomnia. You may have felt some of these in response to normal passing anxiety. Maybe you've felt queasy before a big important test, but imagine feeling that way all the time in response to little things. Uh, and you've got some idea of what it's like to live with GAD. The disorder seems to have many possible causes. Uh, it's probably genetic since it tends to run in families, but it has environmental causes as well since it's sometimes triggered by experiencing normal stress. It's also been associated with addictions to alcohol or sedatives. The part of the brain that actually processes fear called the amygdala has also been related to GAD and it seems like if its connections to the rest of the brain are interrupted, it can result in increased anxiety. So there may be a biological cause as well. But with all these factors, it is difficult to tell if they cause GAD or if they are simply further symptoms of it. Phobias is another anxiety disorder you might be familiar with. Uh, you've probably heard of some of the long, complicated names like arachnophobia. Anybody know what that is? Spiders. Spiders, the fear of spiders. Uh, Triskaidekaphobia. It's the fear of the number 13. These are known as specific phobias. Someone with arachnophobia has an out of proportion anxious response to a specific trigger, spiders, but not in other situations. It's interesting, uh, I don't know if you guys remember Taylor Mason. I mean, you probably do. They had the whole freer from cancer type deals, but she's taking a psychology class over at Ivy Tech right now. And so she emails me her homework uh, and I go over it with her. <laughs> As it was. We, just, we just wrote a big paper about the fear of spiders yesterday to illustrate uh, how to treat uh, in a couple different ways someone's fear of spiders. Uh, Indiana Jones from the movies Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, isn't somebody we'd think of as having generalized anxiety, but he certainly has a phytophobia, a fear of snakes, if you remember. Some people also have social phobias or anxiety that is produced by having to interact with other people. Fear in general social interactions is known as social anxiety. Have you ever felt nervous before going to a party where you might not know everybody? Or before you had to go to an event where you were expected to network or maybe even speak in public? If so, you've experienced mild and temporary social anxiety like with GAD. Social anxiety only becomes a disorder though when it is out of proportion, constant or debilitating. If your anxiety actually prevented you from attending any social functions, you'd have social anxiety disorder. Now, just as people with a specific phobia like Indiana Jones fear of snakes experience anxiety with only certain triggers, some people have social anxiety set off by particular situations. And this is known as a specific social phobia. So you may have a phobia of speaking in public. You don't mind being at a big party and, you know, meeting and talking in small groups to a couple, three people who are also joining in the conversation. But when it's centered on you and you're addressing the whole room, that might be a specific phobia. So you've probably felt uncomfortable using a public restroom as well at some point in your life. They're kind of gross. The whole process is ripe for potential embarrassment. But for someone with paresis, using the public restrooms induces debilitating anxiety. They literally cannot use the bathroom while other people are around. And this is played for laughs in a number of TV shows, but it can really make life difficult for those whose activities are limited by needing to find a private restroom. Phobias are often understood in terms of classical conditioning. Pavlov caused dogs to drool at the ring of the bell by presenting food and ringing the bell at the same time. And though the dogs initially drooled because of the food, they came to associate the presence of food with the bell sound and would drool in anticipation when only the bell was rung. Some psychologists think that phobias may be formed by classical conditioning in a negative sense. Uh, think of our friend at the beginning with the birds. Uh, they, in, a, in a way, she was classically conditioned to be afraid of birds. So Indiana Jones was fine with snakes as a child. If you remember the uh, Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade, the movie starts off with him as a kid. But as a teenager, he fell into a cage filled with snakes during a stressful chase scene at, in the beginning of The Last Crusade. And so all the stress and anxiety he was feeling was now coupled with the snakes, and he was conditioned to uh, put those feelings of fear with the snakes, and now he's scared of them. So in this case, it only took one negative association to make him fear snakes the rest of his life. 
The last anxiety disorder we'll discuss is obsessive compulsive disorder known as OCD. Now, I do not have TikTok. Uh, but I did see this morning that there is a young lady, I believe in New York, who has severe OCD that put a video on TikTok, and I wanted to try, I didn't see it until a few minutes before class, so I wanted to try to find it and uh, show it to you, but if you have TikTok and if you want to look it up on your own, feel free. I might try to find it and show it to you uh, tomorrow, but uh, it's it, it apparently is really illustrative. Like, for example, uh, she she records her day, basically, and how OCD affects her day. And the only part of it I really saw in just a quick read of the article was her eating breakfast. And literally, she had to tap the table three times, put her spoon on the edge of the bowl, touch her nose to the bowl three times. I mean, it was this whole elaborate pattern of behavior before she could actually engage in eating breakfast, which also itself was a stylized pattern of behavior. Um, a great movie. Uh, if you want to watch a movie that has to deal with OCD, it's called As Good As It Gets. It has Jack Nicholson. Uh, and that might be, a, you know, an interesting if you're looking for something to watch during the break here and want to understand OCD a little bit more. But as uh, portrayed in the media, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is the neat freak's disease. Uh, TV characters like Detective Adrian Monk, if you remember that show on USA Network a few years ago, Monk, are shown pouring boiling water over toothbrushes, carefully arranging rows of identical suits. And it's true that many with obsessive compulsive disorder are overly concerned about germs and need to keep their things tidy, but these are just some of the many manifestations of the basic condition. Uh, I, in, I don't know, I wouldn't say I, I had OCD in a psychological diagnose, diagnostic sense, but I went through a period when I was a kid where whenever anybody said anything to me or whatever I was saying to them, I had to spell out on my leg in groups of four letters. I know it sounds weird, I don't know why I did it. And you know what got me to stop is one day I just said, why the hell am I doing this? This is bizarre. But I, I, it, it went on for about a year. And like I had to ask people to slow down so I could keep up with putting the letters in four groups. It was weird, I know, but I don't know why I started. And I know why I finished because I was like, why the hell am I doing this? This makes no sense. So at its heart, OCD is characterized by both, wait for it, obsessions and compulsions. Obsessions are intrusive ideas and thoughts that a person with OCD can't stop thinking about. Imagine what it feels like to have a song stuck in your head. Now imagine if that song were instead a worry that you'd forgotten to turn off the oven. Being unable to get rid of these kinds of thoughts can understandably cause anxiety. And that's where the compulsions come in. Compulsions are behaviors that are used to cope with anxiety. And they're often ritualistic, like washing your hands seven times or tapping your doorknob three times before you leave the house. And these rituals can become extremely disruptive, even causing anxiety that they are supposed to relieve. OCD is the fourth most common psychological disorder affecting approximately one in 50 American adults. And psychologists have offered many potential causes. Uh, the neurotransmitter serotonin is often present at abnormal levels in the brain with people with OCD. And the disease seems to be somewhat heritable, uh, especially if it develops during early childhood. Some psychologists speculate that OCD may represent the extreme forms of behavior that are normally evolutionarily adapt adaptive, uh, being persistent enough to check under every bush, not just some of them for snakes, for example, is a useful trait that could develop into the kind of compulsive behavior that people with OCD display today. Any questions about the uh, disorders that we've kind of gone over today? Nope. Okay. Well, that's no. all I have for today. So hopefully uh, we'll see you tomorrow and uh, we can continue talking about these psychological disorders. Good news, there's only 128 people ahead of me right now. So, yay. All right, I'll see you guys tomorrow.